Okay, you can see behind me there are a lot of notes there. Um, so this is probably the weightier of the three arguments that we're taking a look at. Um, the first two were kind of a preamble um, to this one, which is the important one, uh, which begins on page 29 with the words, here begins the, uh, begins the proof. And namely, that's the proof that, that love is a fourth kind of beneficial madness. So this is Socrates, whoops, I forgot to put it up there, two and the second speech. Um, so that's what we are talking about there. Now, um, unfortunately, uh, this, uh, this, this proof, this, this second speech, uh, begins with you know, what, in my opinion, is the worst argument um, that I've ever read for the immortality of the soul. So um, what I would do if I were you and reading this is um, sort of stop reading at 245C on your page uh, 29 and flip over to page 30 um, to four, uh, 246A. Right, uh, which is the end of that argument. I just go la 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 and pretend the argument isn't there because it's a bad argument. It doesn't demonstrate what it attempts to demonstrate. And um, in fact, if you want three good arguments for the immortality of the soul, or at least better arguments for the immortality of the soul, um, you will find them in uh, the, the, the Plato's five dialogues in um, the Phaedo. Right, which is the last of the five dialogues. Um, I don't generally teach that one, not because it's not interesting, but it's sort of transitional um, insofar as it seems to be Socrates' position with a lot of Plato tacked on to it, um, where Socrates, the character, starts um, it, right at, at the point where somebody has brought him the poison to drink. Uh, to speculate uh, with regard to why he should be in good cheer and expect good things um, at death kind of thing. So there are these arguments for the immortality of the soul. Um, what we are going to engage with here is going to address one of those arguments, which is the argument for recollection. Um, just for now, um, do me a favor and um, leap over that argument, uh, like I say, um, leap from 245C over to 246A, pretend la 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 like that didn't happen, except grant Plato the hypothesis for the moment of an immortal soul, right? Just put it in brackets and say, okay, okay, we need an immortal soul, right? And there are arguments for this. Um, we will get to the argument from recollection, which uh, doesn't quite get us as far as immortal, but gets us as far as the soul pre-existing and being more durable than the body. All right. Now, um, yeah, I know that was fancy, but nonetheless, this is a good dialogue in other ways. Um, <clears throat> What Plato turns to after he flubs his argument for the immortality of the soul is um, uh, to describe something of the soul's structure. It right? uh, starts on page 30. I'm just going to read it a little bit. Now, here's what we must say about its structure. To describe what the soul um, uh, actually is would require a very long account, altogether a task for God in every way. But to say what it's like is humanly possible and takes less time. So he's going to give us a metaphor to understand the structure of the human soul. All right. So let us do the second in our speech. Um, let us then liken the soul to the natural union of a team of winged horses and their charioteer. The gods have um, horses and charioteers that themselves um, that are themselves all good and come from good stock besides, while everybody else has a mixture. To begin with, our driver is in charge of a pair of horses. Second, one of his horses is beautiful and good and from the same stock um, uh, and from uh, stock of the same sort. Well, the other is the opposite and has the opposite sort of bloodline. This means that chariot driving is inevitably painful and difficult business. All right. So this is a metaphor. 
and this is only one of the times that Plato's used this metaphor for the soul. Picture yourself driving, driving a chariot. Right? You've got two horses, one that listens to what you say, one that is obedient and does exactly what it is supposed to do, it takes direction, and cooperates in the endeavor of the whole chariot activity. And the other one that just kind of wants what it wants when it wants it, right? Doesn't listen to instruction. It's belligerent to directions. It's not engaged in the activity of chariot driving and that sort of thing. Now, effectively in this scenario, if you're trying to get from point A to point B in your chariot and you've got one horse that's going to listen to you, but another horse that wants to go over here and go over there and not move at all, that sort of thing, you're not going to be able to get anywhere. And in fact, that one horse is going to be destructive to the entire apparatus. Now, effectively, what Plato is arguing here is that we are in a similar situation. And I've got a little pie chart for you here um, to describe this. It's not showing up too well on video, right? There are three parts to the human soul, right? One is the chariot driver, which is rational, right? And that is that aspect of the human soul which is rational. Two is our good horse and noble and um, from the same stock, takes direction well, um, is engaged in um, the whole sort of procedure of, um, I'm just going to redraw this. Uh, this is not so good. Sorry, I thought coloring it in would be it would be helpful, but I guess not. So here's our imperfect circle. Here is that. Here is that. Here is that. One, two, three. There we go. That's better. Now we can see what we're doing. Um, that part of us, that small sliver, is just how rational Plato sees us as. Right? Reason is a small little sliver of the soul. Right. Sort of akin to the size of a chariot driver relative to the rest of the chariot, including the horses. Horses are big, people are a lot smaller. Right. Now, the second horse, it does what it's told. Right. It listens to reason. It takes direction well. It wants to behave. It wants to do what is going to be beneficial. Right. Whereas part number three is... Um, desire. So you have three parts of the soul. A fancy way of saying this is the soul is tripartite. Reason, self-control, and desire are the parts and relative to one another, reason and self-control do not even meet the size of desire. Right. Now, Plato's moral psychology starts to come into focus here. Right. Now, effectively, Right. What we were looking at in Socrates is that reason should be in control and desire should be sort of shoved out the window. If we see these parts of the soul as relative power, it's going to be a very thin minority of the population who is going to be able to be in rational control of themselves. And what's more, in terms of our dialogue about erotic love, right? This desirous part of the soul is huge and tends to overpower the better elements, right? Remember, acquired judgment follows reason towards what is best, right? So reason and self-control working together, right, form acquired judgment. But when they come into conflict, desire usually wins. Right? So our discussion of Eros winds up actually making a bit of sense here. Right? So I'm just going to move this a little bit closer so you can see the notes a little bit better. Now, I'm going to introduce you very quickly to Plato's metaphysics, his epistemology, and his ethics. Right? Metaphysics being the underlying nature of truth, 
epistemology. We, we're familiar with that by now. It's uh, his theory of knowledge, right? And ethics uh, being a theory of action, right? It's remember the previous video where I discussed these um, three elements of philosophy, right? Uh, Plato's got strong distinctions between these, yet they work in tandem in terms of a really interesting system for Plato. Now, we are a co combination of body and soul, right? Here we are, stick person in the world, my lovely artistic abilities here. Plato uh, kind of cuts us in half. We are aspects, we have psychic aspects which are related to our soul which has this structure but we are also bodily beings meaning we have what senses we are desirous that's an eye sorry my <laughs> my ability to write on board seems to have gone down a cliff there we're desirous and we are mortal Soul is rational and immortal. The body is sensate, it's desirous, and it is mortal. Uh, the combination of this, he tells us on page 31, is what is called a living thing. The whole combination of soul and body is called the living thing or animal and has the designation mortal as well. Such a combination cannot be immortal, not in any reasonable account. Why? because this relates to Plato's metaphysics, our bodies are material. They are things. They are sensible things in the world. They are quite clearly, hairline, right, subject to change, right? So, right, we come into being, we pass away. The only aspect of us that is immortal is the soul which has reason, self-control, and desire. These are sort of motive forces by Plato's account. Now, here we are as living things in the world that are combinations of body and soul, and the world that we live in, insofar as it's given to us by our senses, right, is the world of appearances, a world in which things appear to us. Right? So you see a cat, it's got black fur, and it goes meow, and it's that big kind of thing, right? It's, it's, it's a sensible kind of thing, and you see it in the world. It's given to you by your senses. But remember what I just said about cat? How do you identify a cat as a cat if you are encountering a particular thing in the world? There is no thing in the world that is not particular. Right? How we make sense of the things in the world, how we encounter these things, what's really real about cats and dogs and apples and rice pudding and what have you, right? is the, uh, the form or the idea that makes the thing what it is. Right? These forms or ideas, unlike our bodies and other things in the world are not subject to change. These forms are not multiple. Well, there are many cats that we encounter in the world. There is but one idea of cat that they all sort of fit into. Right? They're not subject to change. There, uh, there is multiplicity and, uh, and these ideas are permanent. They're not subject to change. Right? If Plato had a cat and I have a cat. They are essentially the same cat, even though they're separated by like 2,500 years. All right. So effectively, according to Plato, all right, the idea of the thing is what makes a thing a thing. That idea, here's the catch, exists in a world distinct from that which we exist in the realm of appearances, right? We exist in the realm of appearances, and there is this metaphysical realm of forms or ideas. I know this is hard to make sense of, right? Well, what's a good example? Well, let's, let's stick with the cat, right? I had a cat by the name of Sheldon. He was a good boy. I got him as a little kitten kind of thing. He had a little wussy meow. meow. 
that he was hoping it would grow out of he didn't kind of thing. He was a black and white cat. He was a cow cat, I called him. Some people called him a tuxedo cat. He was more of a cow, more of a dog, really. He was kind of bad at being a cat. He was that kind of cat that would come bounding to the door when you came in, right? Thought he was a dog, that sort of thing. He'd jump up on you. Um, he could do tricks, right? he go Sheldon up, up, and he could sort of walk on his hind legs. His record was 10 steps. Right? It's kind of amazing. Right? And then atop that, he was a boy. Right? He was a boy cat kind of thing. He lived here in Windsor, Canada with me kind of thing. Most of his life, he passed away a couple of years ago, and his softball-sized mound of ca cancer in his kidneys, kind of thing. So, right, that was my cat, Sheldon. Everything I t just told you about Sheldon could be false, and that thing could still be a cat, right? What's included in the form? Nothing sensible, nothing particular. These forms or ideas are and to a certain extent, definitional, right? Cats are black and white, no. Not all cats are black and white. Cats have wussy little meows. Well, no, jungle cats don't have wussy little meows. They've got large, intimidating growls, right? Um, cats are boys. No, that's not true. There are female cats and there are male cats. Cats do tricks, they walk on their hind legs. No, not true, not all of them. How about cats have hair? No, no, they're hairless cats, right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So effectively, the idea of the thing almost bears no, resentful to any of this, uh, re uh, no resemblance to any of the sensate attributes of a particular thing that we encounter in the world insofar as these ideas are permanent, unchanging, and universal, that is, generalizable over all particular cases of particular things that we encounter in the world. Right? So, Sheldon being Sheldon, maybe all of those particular sensate things matter to his identity. Right? But cat None of those particular things actually are what make Sheldon a cat. It's the essence, the idea, or form of catness, not the Hunger Games one, right? but the abstract form of cat that makes a cat a cat. So these essences are, well, essential. Right? The particulars are, well, they're accidental, right? You don't need Sheldon or my other cat, Hugo, or any of the strays I see currently walking past a window because my neighbor feeds them, right? You don't need those in order to uh, perpetuate the essence of cat. It's the essence of cat that makes a cat a cat, right? That makes particular things what they are. Particular things do not shape the essence. The essence shapes the particular things. Make sense? Hopefully. Um, I've included another video on your package of videos. Uh, it's um, sort of a beginner treatment of Plato's theory of the forms. It uses apples to get at the same sort of idea. Right, so, um, well, the same sort of idea, precisely the same form or idea as I'm talking about here, um, which should be helpful um, to you in discussing this, right? But nonetheless, right, for Plato, it's, it, this realm, this world of the forms, this metaphysical well, realm that is really real, and effectively, we are in existing within a world of appearances and imitations of these forms or ideas, which we take to be real mistakenly, right? So, why am I talking about this in, in conjunction with love? Plato needs to explain this in order to explain why love, Eros, is actually beneficial, right? So, we are these combinations of body and soul, right? What's really real are these forms, which are 
abstract, universal, perfect, they lack nothing, they're not subject to change, etc., etc., etc. Now, here's the question, the epistemological dilemma. If nothing we encounter in this existence as this combination of body and soul right, is remotely the same, right, similar, right, to like in, in terms of what we sense to these forms or ideas, how do we come to a knowledge of these forms or ideas? You can't, according to Plato, infer from, you know, seeing 20 cats what the essence of cat is, right? Because all we ever sense are the accidental attributes of particular things. If I look at a chair, all I see is, well, we could use this one. Uh, as an example, wood and, well, that's final, I was about to say le leather of a particular size, etc., etc., right? All we ever see is the accidental attributes of a particular thing. We never really see the essence. We have to use reason to get at the essence of a thing, right? So when I see a cat, I see black and white, or orange, or gray, or a particular size. I, I smell them coming, right? Um, in, in the case of the strays outside, um, I hear them, that sort of thing. It's all I ever see is what is particular about them. And specifically, these forms, ideas, or essences include nothing that is particular to this or that animal. They only contain the universal. Right. So, how do we actually get to these essences? We don't infer from the particular. Right. We have to use reason to think abstractly and specifically engage in an act of what Plato calls recollection. And this is where we're going to get the argument pertaining to the soul. It seems fairly clear that, uh, that we do actually reason in this way. Right. We, we do have access to these forms or ideas. I see table, I see chair, I see cat, I see dog, I see door, I see doorknob, I see car, I see bike, I see tree, I see flower, right? I see rock. Right? All of these things right, are things that I intellectually, through reason, am able to judge in terms of their universal attributes. We do use these all the time. Yet, since as long as we have been living things, combinations of body and soul, all we ever encounter are that which we can sense. And all we can sense are the particular aspects or attributes of particular things. Yet we dwell in this realm of the universal. How did we gain access to that realm of the universal? Plato's got an answer from before. Nothing we ever encounter is sufficiently perfect or has that aspect of the universal. No. Yet, we're able to utilize these forms or essences as we, we wouldn't be able to open a door right, or sit in a chair without being able to utilize this theory of the forms to some extent, right? So we must be born with some sort of hazy knowledge of the forms. We must be, whenever we utilize one of these forms, whether it be cat, dog, triangle, circle, square, right, um, it, it, the best examples of these were mathematical, right? Um, according to Plato, right? Here, here's, here's a funny example. What's that? Oh, it's a triangle. Well, no, it's not. A triangle is mathematically perfect, right? There is an abstract idea of triangle that this representation, this imperfect drawing of a triangle that I've just drawn right? It does not fit, right? Mathematical geometric shapes 
we don't come across perfect ones of them in the world. We never come across anything that is perfectly circular or triangular or what have you. Right? Yet, nonetheless, we are able to reason our way to triangularity or circularity or squareness or what have you, rectangularity. Is that a word? I don't know. Anyhow, right? And uh, we're able to utilize numbers. We never come across two, for example, in existence. Right? All we ever see are one thing next to another thing. Two is something we have to reason towards. Moral questions operate much the same way. Justice. Draw it. Draw justice. Uh, you can't. You can't draw justice. All we ever see in terms of actions are particular people doing particular things. We have to use reason to judge just or unjust. Right? So, these forms right, are abstract. We get there by thinking, not by perceiving, not by looking, not by sensing. Right? So, we're that far. Well, since we are this combination of body and soul, right, we need the soul in order to explain how we have encountered and thus have access to these forms. Plato's explanation from before, right, which is a compelling account because we do have access to these forms or ideas, right, is the answer. Right? So, in order to explain how we have access to the forms or ideas, the answer from before only becomes lucid if our soul pre-exists the body. What this means is that all learning, all learning of the metaphysical sort, all learning of the underlying truth about reality, is recollection. We just recall it from before. So. Here's the mythic story. Plato's got a mythic story for this. Before we became living things, that is, combination of body and soul, we were swirling around in this realm of the forms kind of thing, right? And the forms are the proper nourishment of the soul, right? The soul needs to apprehend so much of the forms in order to remain in this heavenly realm of the forms. Well, remember the distinction between gods and human beings that Plato was making? Um, your page 31. Right. The gods have horses and chariots that are themselves all good and come from good stock, while everyone else has a mis mixture. To begin with, our driver is in charge of a pair of horses. Second, one of his horses is beautiful and good and from stock of the same sort. Right? That's self-control. Right? Well, the other is the opposite and has the opposite sort of bloodline. It's desirous kind of thing. It doesn't know what's best for it. It wants what it wants when it wants it kind of thing. And effectively, what that untrained horse or part of the soul actually occasions for us is we get jostled out of line and don't get enough of the nourishment from the perfect truth of the forms so that we become so malnourished that we fall right, and effectively forget everything that we've apprehended before except for the dimmest recollections. So effectively and I'm phrasing it kind of weird here, the game for us right, is within our lives to try and recall as much of this perfect truth as possible, thereby nourishing our soul right, so that we can regain our access to this he heavenly realm. Right, because effectively, down here in the world of uh, the world of appearances, everything is sort of a veil of tears. Right? Things come into being, things pass away. Us too. Right? Our bodies are 
temporary, they're mutable, they, are, they come into being, they pass away, we grow old, we die, we're born, etc. Right? Uh, everything that we encounter in this world is temporary right? and imperfect, and that's frustrating. Right? So effectively, we want to be up here. But we don't necessarily want to be down here. Don't kill yourself because then you won't actually train yourself in terms of this recollection to regain access to this perfect realm of the forms. Right? So effectively, right, we hit the earth so hard that we forgot. Right? So effectively, in this existence, all learning is recollection. Right? And learning is what properly nourishes our soul, whereas food is what, and, and drink is what nourishes our body. Right? So, right. let me see, where is it here? Um, ba -doo, boo, 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 boo. Um, just to illustrate this, page 35. The reason there's so much e eagerness to see um, the, 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 the plane where truth stands is um, uh, that this pasture has uh, the grass that is the right food for the best part of our soul. And it is uh, the nature of wings to lift up uh, the soul to be nourished by it. Besides, uh, the law of destiny is this. If any soul becomes a companion to a god and catches sight of uh, any true thing, it will be unharmed until the next circuit. And if, this is a, uh, if it is able to uh, do this every time, it's always safe. If, on the other hand, it does not see anything true because it could not keep up, because it's a bad horse, um, and by some accident, and uh, by some accident, takes it on a burden. Uh, it takes on a, it takes on a burden of forgetfulness and wrongdoing. Then it's weighed down, sheds its wings, and falls to earth. At this point, according to the law, the soul is not born into a wild animal in its first incarnation, right? but the soul. Uh, that has seen the most is planted the seed uh, is planted in the seed of a man who will become a lover of wisdom or of beauty or will be cultivated in the arts and prone to the erotic love. Uh, the second sort of so uh, soul will be put into somebody who will be a lawful king a or a warlike commander. The third, a statesman, a manager of a household, a financier. Uh, the fourth will be a trainer who loves exercise, or a doctor who cures uh, the body, the fifth um, uh, uh, will lead the life of a prophet, or a priest of the mysteries, the sixth, the life of a poet, etc. Et Anyhow, you get to be a human being, right? That's pretty cool because human beings are um, not only this mixture of body and soul, but rational creatures who can engage in philosophy. That is this learning, which is recollection of what's really real, right? So, I know this sounds a little crazy to you, right? But if you think about anything you study at um, university, right? It's a study of these forms or abstract ideas. I know that's a big claim, right? Well, what about chemistry? Do you care about what's in that particular Petri dish or are you trying to extract some sort of understanding of an abstract universal principle which is simply being enacted through this experiment. Are you testing an abstract hypothesis? Do you have an idea that you're enacting in a science experiment? Or do you care about the actual petri dish? You'll find it's the idea that, 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 that wins that argument. If you're studying ethics, it's all about abstract ideas. The particulars are, you know, suffering that's no good, that sort of thing. But justice is an abstract notion that we then apply to particular cases. Right? Virtue, piety, that sort of thing. Likewise, ah, dropped a piece of my chalk. I'll get it later. So, right, um, anything you study, engineering, right, or physics, right, we're talking about abstract principles and universalizable theories, right? That's, uh, I mean, 
even psychology, basically what we're trying to do is come up with abstract principles or laws that govern the human psyche, right? I, so I could go on to just about every field that we study at university, and those fields are some aspect of this abstract truth, whether or not it's what Plato says it is, right? that's another matter. So here's the story, right? We were up here swinging around with the gods. We got bumped out of place and took on some um, burden of forgetfulness and wrongdoing. We fell to the earth. We forgot everything. So now down here, nothing we encounter is really real. It's the only thing that's real is what's up there in the metaphysical realm of the forms or the ideas. So, right, how do we regain that? Through thinking, not by sensing, and specifically through an act of recollection, recalling that which we already knew, right? Um, so, right, now, what Plato has to do is it, it make a case for this, uh, for Eros being a fourth kind of madness, right? <coughs> so, right, do 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 do. I'll just start reading on the, um, uh, 37. 36, right, um, rage below 249b, right, uh, from there a human soul can enter uh, a wild animal and a soul um, that was once human can move from an animal to a human being again, but a soul that never saw the truth cannot take human shape since a human being must understand speech in terms of general forms. You see, Speech depends on the forms. I can't say cat, dog, race, pudding, cup, chair, table without referencing the forms. So we need speech. It's generally so we've got speech. We're part of the way to the forms um, through recollection already. Uh, proceeding by many perceptions together to, into a reasoned unity. That process is the recollection of things our soul saw when it was traveling with, uh, with God. When it disregarded uh, the things we uh, now call real and lifted up its head to what is truly real instead, it rhymes. Uh, for just this reason, it's uh, fair that only a philosopher's mind grows wings, since its memory always keeps it as close as possible to the realities by um, uh, being close to uh, which the gods are divine. A man who uses um, uh, uh, <clears throat> reminders of these things correctly is always the highest, mo most perfect level of initiation, and he is the only one who is, um, is perfect as perfect can be. He stands outside human concerns and draws close to the divine. Ordinary people think he's disturbed and rebuke him for this, unaware that he is possessed by God. Now, this takes um, me to the whole point of my discussion of the fourth kind of madness, uh, that which someone shows when he uh, sees beauty, he sees the beauty we have down here, is reminded of true beauty. Then he takes uh, the wing and flutters um, uh, his eagerness to rise up but is unable to do so when he gazes aloft like a bird paying no attention to what is down below. And um, that is what brings him uh, the, the charge that he has gone mad. This is uh, the best uh, and noblest of the forms that um, uh, the, the possession by the god can take for anyone uh, that, uh, who has connected to it. And when someone who loves beautiful boys is touched by uh, this madness, um, he is called a lover. As I said, the na uh, nature requires that every soul, uh, uh, that the soul of every human being has seen reality. Otherwise, no soul uh, could have entered this sort of living thing. Not that, uh, but not every soul is easily reminded of the reality. Uh, there by what it finds here, not, soul, uh, not souls that uh, got only a brief glance at the reality there, not souls 
who had such bad luck when they fell down here that they were twisted by bad company into lives of injustice so that they forgot the sacred objects they had seen from before. Only a few remain um, uh, whose memory is good enough. Um, <clears throat> and they started blah, 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 blah. Right? So you get the idea. Right? Now, beauty is going to be the key. Right? There is something distinct about the form of beauty. Right? There are basically three big forms that are you know important here for Plato. Right? These are the three big ones: truth, wisdom. Right? These are you know wisdom, truth as it really is. Right? Then goodness. Right? Justice. Right, that sort of thing as it really is, and beauty. Right, there are three kinds of philosophy. Right, uh, there is metaphysics, there is ethics, uh, there is aesthetics, basically. Right, so beauty, right, is the third really big aspect the good, the true, and the beautiful. Right, as most people write it down, but it's I'm following what we have in the Phaedrus here wisdom as it really is, goodness as it really is, beauty as it really is. These are the three main aspects of the forms, all right? So, all right, there's something handy dandy about the form of beauty. We think about mathematical truth, right? We have to reason all of our way to perfect triangles or perfect circles or perfect squares. Mathematical truth twos and fours and sixes and addition and subtraction and cosines and all of that, right? That's good abstract stuff, but it only involves that rational part of our soul, right? It's a purely dispassionate intellectual kind of endeavor, if you want to accept that by this argument it is, right? Um, Moral truth, we have to reason our way to justice, virtue, piety, that sort of thing. Um, goodness, more generally, is something that we, we judge. It's a rational endeavor. Whereas beauty, beauty, on the other hand, we can bloody well see it. Right? So on page 39, Plato drops this bombshell. Well, that was all for love of a memory that made me stretch out my speech and longing for the past. Now, beauty, as I said, was radiant among the other objects. And now that we have come down here, we grasp it sparkling through the clearest of our senses. Vision, of course, is the sharpest of our bodily senses, although it does not see wisdom. It would awaken a terribly powerful love if an image of wisdom came through our sight as clearly as beauty does. And the same goes for the other objects of inspired love. But now beauty alone has that privilege to be most clearly visible and most loved. Beauty, well, that was noisy. Beauty is special because we can actually see it. Normally when philosophers contemplate the forms, we go from particular to universal. We use the particular as an instance for recollection of the universal. I see a particular action, I judge that to be just, and I contemplate justice and I wind up at a former idea of justice, some sort of inkling of it, the best I can recall, right? Mathematical truth, we never know the true truth, but nonetheless, through engaging in mathematics, we can awaken a partial recognition of what's really real, but it's intellectual. Right? Now, specifically as an aside, uh, Plato's Academy, right? he was the founder of the first university in the Western world. Most of what they taught was mathematics because it is a very good sort of recollection tool, right? according to Plato's theory, uh, for uh, the perfect truth of the forms or ideas. Right? But Beauty is handy dandy because we can actually see it. Let that sink in for a second. Right? The other aspects of the forms we can't really see. 
So we're not as motivated by. Right? Just do a quick sort of summation of your estimation of the number of books that have been written on mathematics. Now put those next to the books that have been written about love, which Plato has defined as the desire for beauty. Right. Flip back to page 18 for a second right, and read through that definition of Eros. The unreasoning desire that overpowers a person's considered impulse to do right is driven to take pleasure in beauty. It's force reinforced by its kindred desires for beauty in human bodies. This desire, all conquering, and its forceful drive takes its name um, uh, from the word for force and is called Eros. So Eros is the desire for beauty that tends to overpower. Right? Okay, that's interesting. Now, let me see, where was it? Sorry, just take me a second here. Skip over to page 22, which is the conclusion of um, that, that first speech by Socrates, right? Where it was brought to a point. These are points you should bear in mind, my boy. You should know that the friendship of a lover arises without any good will at all. No, like food, its purpose is to sate hunger. Do wolves love lambs? That's how lovers befriend a boy. Notice footnote number 47 there. Do wolves love lambs? Agapozen, from the word agape, which is a spiritual kind of love. That's how lovers, from Eros, befriend at philusen, from philia, the same root word as philosophy, right? A boy. Three different verbs for love. So effectively, what Plato is doing in this second speech of Socrates right, is this. He's uniting, and he's fond of his threes, right? Three parts of the soul, reason, self-control, and desire. Three kinds of love that are proper to them, reason, philia, same root word as philosophy. It's an intellectual kind of love with a desire for an aspect of the perfect, perfect truth of the forms, wisdom, or truth as it really is. Let me get on screen here. All right. Then self-control through a spiritual kind of love, agape, all right, with the desire for justice or the good. All right. And then finally, this desirous part of the soul, this is why Eros is related to the largest part of our soul, right? And that's why it's so apt to overcome our better impulses. Desire expresses Eros for beauty. Right? So you've got a part of the soul, a kind of love, for a kind of aspect of the, the, the truth of the forms, or what is nourishment for the soul. Think about that. All right? When Eros gets all Erosy, yeah, that's sort of funny to say, right? but when we are overcome by Eros, that's better, right? what's really happening? that part of our soul is expressing an overpowering desire for its proper nourishment, which is beauty. But remember, we're not in the realm of the forms anymore. We're down here in the realm of appearances. So the soul misinterprets its desire for beauty as something that's sensate and bodily, and it tries to discharge that idea for a particular thing or object in the world. So it effectively wants an orgasm. And an orgasm doesn't feed the soul the kind of nourishment that it needs. Right? So effectively, Eros can be disastrous because this impetuous part of our soul doesn't know what's good for it. It won't listen to reason. 
Right? It's frequently not restrained by the combination of reason and self-control. It wants what it wants when it wants it. It doesn't know what's proper and properly good for it. Rather than aiming for the nourishment of the soul, it aim, aims to nourish the body. And the body wants a physical gratification. So it misinterprets its desire for perfect beauty as desire for an erotic encounter or a series of erotic encounters. So it bypasses the soul altogether. Right? What Plato is suggesting, right, as, get this, platonic love, right, is that a reason and self-control when we encounter the beloved should work extra hard to restrain that desire as part of the soul so that the desirous part of the soul can actually engage in recollection. Uh, so, in a romantic encounter, effectively keep it in your pants. <laughs> it's really that simple, right? Keep it in your pants and allow the other parts of your soul to get what they need as well, because recollection is something that's 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 interesting. These are artificial divisions, right, with regard to the forms, right? If we allow our soul to actually appreciate the beauty of the beloved and for that appreciation to allow us to recall the form or idea of beauty, it's like ragu, the rest of it is in there, right? It's in there. Right? Along with beauty, we get a recollection of the good and the true as well. Right? So that way, right, reason through philia is able to contemplate the perfect truth. Self-control through agape is able to uh, bathe in the nourishment of justice and goodness. Right? And desire through eros is able to be nourished by the beauty of the beloved. I know this sounds abstract and crazy, right? What does this mean in practical terms? Well, first off, the key word is harmony. We're aiming at bringing harmony to the soul, right? So that each part of the soul gets what it needs. But in practical terms, what does this mean? Right? I don't know, and I don't care to delve into your your personal lives and that sort of thing and that's 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 why in the past i've taught this in terms of you know cinematic sort of um examples of this but suffice to say you've at least seen a representation of a casual romantic encounter between two people and that sort of thing it's kind of meaningless isn't it right when two people just have sex and it's just not personal and that sort of thing it's just it's just a bodily act Right? It's not very meaningful. It's not very gratifying. Why isn't it gratifying? Because it's just bod bodily. It's not soulful. Now, if you want a meaningful kind of relationship, restrain your desire for sexual gratification and allow yourself to get to know the person, get to know their mind, get to know them morally. Allow them to get, you, get to know you as a human being as well, right? And what you'll find if you allow yourself to do this, and if you've met the right person, is that you will start to appreciate the intellectual and moral qualities of this person that you, if you're really in love, that you love. Right? If you don't appreciate the intellectual and moral qualities of that person, you probably shouldn't be in the relationship. But nonetheless, if you've met the right person and you're able to restrain your desire for physical gratification well enough to actually appreciate the beauty of the human being, that includes the intellectual and the moral. So you wind up with a relationship which is stimulating intellectually you're, you're, you've got a better and more agile mind right the two of you work together to unlock mysteries and solve puzzles and engage in you know intellectual discussion and debate and that sort of thing 
you'll find that you know your relationship not only makes you want to be a better person but brings out the best in the other as well and then finally yeah it's still hot that's the crazy thing about platonic love if you look at wikipedia right one of the first it's i used to get in battles with wikipedia and that sort of thing i'm one of the editors of this definition of platonic love uh, namely because it's been so wrong for so long right it, it's somewhat better now but nonetheless right uh, one of the first things it says about platonic love is what we mean colloquially by platonic love or joe and susie dating now nah, it's just platonic which usually means a non-sexual, non-erotic kind of relationship. But look what Plato has to say about love. If love is going to do what it needs to do in order for Plato to justify it as a fourth kind of madness that is actually beneficial, guess what? It's going to involve reason, it's going to involve self-control, and it's going to involve desire. That is, philia, agape, and eros. So, by definition, platonic love must involve eros. So, of necessity, platonic love is not an on-erotic kind of love. Seems like a no-brainer, right? So, this is why I say if I, wa if I want to see something about platonic love, if I want to learn something about platonic love, I'm going to ask Plato. Right? Luckily, we've got, we've got Plato right here. All right. So, what's good about platonic love? All right. One, it brings harmony to the soul. Think about it. If you were simply opposing self, uh, reason and self-control to desire, you've got two problems, not one. One of your problems, the first, is that you know, you'll probably lose. Look, look at the size differential. Desire is much a much larger part of the human soul than even reason and self-control put together. So you're going to lose. Most of the time, more times than not, you're not going to be able to control it yourself if you're simply opposing reason and self-control to desire. Your other problem is that even when you're successful, you've got one part of yourself which is in conflict with another large part of yourself. Even if you're successful at restraining desire and I, it, I know some some of you have probably thought well geez if you've got a horse that's part of your chariot team that isn't doing what it's supposed to do take it around the barn and shoot it right you just get rid of this thing well no because it's a metaphor for you or at least that most valuable and most noble part of you you can't take your horse around the barn and shoot it you don't want to be in constant conflict. Right? What Plato has done here is suggested a way to give each part of the soul what it needs in terms of nourishment. This isn't a bad horse. It's just impetuous and poorly trained and won't listen. The reason it becomes problematic and we do nasty, jerky, hurtful, jealous, stupid kind of things because of love specifically, but otherwise, is because it doesn't know what the heck it's doing. Reason has to tell it. That's why the metaphor of the chariot, charioteer, and the team of horses makes sense. It's not, it's not, as several of my students in the past have suggested, like an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other, and you've got to determine exactly which one to... No, that means you let a horse drive the cart. No, it's uh, the charioteer has to drive the cart. You've got to be in control. It's not you're pulled one way or the other. You have to be in control. Reason has to be in control and direct self-control and desire because they don't they don't know what's good for them what's good about self-control is that it listens to reason and thus gets its nourishment if desire listened to reason then it would get its nourishment too so right. so right that's one thing it brings harmony to the soul right the second thing is that that eros is good for 
right, is it brings us closer to a knowledge of the perfect forms of the truth. Why? Because beauty is that handy dandy form that we can actually see. We can actually see beauty, right? Which makes it a better recollection tool than any perfect triangle or any court case, in, which is an example of justice or any political system, which might be an example of justice. It's better than any of that because we can actually, it engages, we can actually see it. It's the most powerful recollection cue that we've got. So Eros brings us closer to a knowledge of the perfect form. And third, here's, here's an interesting third thing uh, that platonic love does. Remember the problem with erotic love is objectification, right? If hypothetically in a thought experiment, I were to love you in the erotic sense that we were talking about in the first two videos, I wouldn't really care about you. I would care about fulfilling my desire. You would be the object of my desire. Right? And you don't, you don't want you don't want a relationship like that. You don't want your beloved to think of you like that. You don't want to, if, if you suspect you're in that kind of a relationship, run, run, right? That is a horrible kind of relationship. So to a certain extent, the first two arguments stand, right? But, right, in a platonic relationship where desire is restrained, reason and self-control are allowed to orient themselves to a relationship. You get to know the person. You express all three kinds of love. You appreciate all of the aspects and dimensions of the other person. This is the only kind of relationship that looks straight at the other, right? It's the only moral, morally justifiable kind of relationship that there can be, where you appreciate the psychic qualities of your beloved. My partner and I, right, we're in one of these relationships. Man, she is intelligent. We get into some wonderful intellectual discussions and debates. She's really trying to be a good person. Right? I appreciate her moral qualities and it brings out the best in me as well. Right? And yeah, it's hot. Right? But even when we aren't wrapped up in erotic embrace, I can appreciate her beauty. I think her is mine, her, mine, right? That sort of thing. You see, this is the kind of relationship where you actually encounter the whole person, right? And appreciate the whole person. Now, uh, that, was, that was Plato's Phaedrus. That's what we're talking about there. All right. Here's a bonus. Remember the contradiction between Heraclitus and Parmenides? Right. It's a funny thing that, that, that Plato just kind of snuck in with this bit of his, his epistemology and his ethics. Heraclitus argued that you can't step into the same river twice. Things come, into be, uh, come to being, things pass away. Right. He was an empiricist, and the one constant aspect of truth that that, that that his senses give give him our flux it is flux right so if we trust our senses everything in this realm of appearances and it is in a constant state of change multiplicity and flux though oddly through the exercise of logos reason and language it all makes a certain kind of sense so he suggested we find the unity in opposites and that sort of thing Sounds suspiciously like this part of the equation, right? With some sort of rational sort of stretch towards the realm of the forms. On the other hand, remember Parmenides argued, being is simply that which is, that which is not, cannot be, and can't even be spoken of. Non-being is not rationally consistent, it's not intelligible, it doesn't make any sense, and it cannot be used as an explanatory principle. Right? 
So, effectively, everything is one. There can be no change, no multiplicity, no flux. Realm of the forms, is there change? No, they are perfectly what they are. Is there multiplicity? Well, well, there are many cats down here. There is but one form of cat. <coughs> and effectively, more generally, no flux. So, effectively, what Plato has done by laying out his metaphysics and epistemology this way is found a way for Heraclitus to be right and Parmenides to be right and for them to not contradict one another. And all Plato had to do was cut the universe in half and then cut the human being in half. Right? We are combinations of radically distinct things called body and soul. And the universe is a combination of radically distinct aspects called forms or ideas and appearances, the intelligible realm and the sensible realm. Right? So no must, no fuss. That's a bonus reason platonic love or Plato's metaphysics and epistemology more generally are useful. Now, I have a couple of um, older review videos um, that I'm going to add to this playlist as well. Um, just for your reference, um, I think I kind of went quickly through this and I'm not really happy with the way that my notes are showing up on the board, but nonetheless, um, I think you've got a good primer on Plato's uh, metaphysics, epistemology and ethics and his positions on love. So um, if the following videos are uh, going to be useful to you. Um, it's, I wish you the best in using them. If not, um, everything I'm going to test you on is um, on the videos where I'm wearing this blue shirt. So um, anyhow, thank you and uh, have good days, one for each of you.